Hi there! My name is Neil Blevins, and this tutorial is called 10 Things to Check Before Calling a Painting Done. So you've worked hard all week on a new painting, and you're ready to call it done. But is it really done, or have you left something out? Something that you will regret not fixing later? The old adage is, art is never finished, only abandoned. But before abandoning it, I run through a list of 10 things to check first. Performing this checklist, while never creating perfect art, has managed to improve pretty much every painting I've made in small or large ways. I sometimes call this my tweaks phase. So here's some tips to turn that good painting into a great painting. Number one, does the painting tell a story? Hopefully this has been an important aspect of your entire process, and you've worked hard to make artistic decisions to back up your story. But it's well worth a final check. Sometimes the story can get lost or weakened during the painting process. And story doesn't have to be anything complex. If it's an artwork for a movie or a book, then sure, you might be illustrating an actual story moment. But even something like trying to get a specific mood across is story. So if my story is a scary scene where the viewer is afraid of what horrible thing is hiding in the fog, look at your painting as objectively as possible. Does the painting tell that story? What's the hook of the image? What's the thing that you're trying to communicate that people will find compelling? So number two is composition check. I've done quite a number of tutorials on various compositional subjects, which I've linked below. But let's do a quick rundown to see if these various compositional ideas are as good as they could be. So first is dramatic camera angle. Do you have a dramatic camera angle in your image? Or are you basically looking straight on your subject? And if you are looking straight on your subject, you have to ask yourself, why are you doing this? Is it important for the story you're trying to convey? Or maybe that dramatic camera angle will provide a more visually interesting image. Next is compositional weight. Is the image visually balanced? Would adding a different crop improve the painting? Either adding some space to a side or removing it, would that improve it? Maybe a wider canvas would give the image more of a filmic look. So another important one is the focal point. Does everything lead the eye back to the focal point of the painting? And have you set up appropriate contrasts to make this happen? Next is an eye flow diagram. Create little arrows showing how the shapes and contrast areas move the eye around the image. And does the eye actually move around the whole image successfully? Or do some elements of the composition lead the eye off the painting by accident? Next is layers of light and dark. Are you using layers of light and dark to give separation between elements in the painting? Next is a perspective check. It's so easy during the painting process to accidentally flatten things out, even though you were trying to paint something in, say, three quarters of view. So make sure you haven't made any big perspective mistakes. Next is a tangent check. Check to make sure there aren't two objects that are almost overlapping each other, but not quite, unless the visual tension of that tangent is something you're using to try to direct the eye. Next is to check for good depth. For example, does your painting have a strong foreground, midground, and background, or does it end up looking really flat? And finally under composition is depth cues. Does the painting need fog? Does it have a repeating element that gets smaller in the distance? Because that's a really great technique to create depth. And does the texture on the far rocks look similar on the more distant rocks than on the closer rocks? So number three is color and light check. So check the color and lighting in your image. First off, color complexity. Does the image have enough color complexity to it? It's good to have a solid color scheme for the image, but are there some nice accidental colors in there so it isn't too monochromatic? Unless, of course, the whole point of the image is to be monochromatic. So next is an overlay layer to paint dark and light. So to help draw the eye to the important parts of the image, place a layer on top of your painting set to overlay mode and paint with a really large soft brush set to 10% opacity, either black or white, to make some parts of the painting brighter and some darker. Also add a levels layer and make sure you're using the full spectrum of dark and light. Except in very rare cases, you don't want an image that doesn't have some pure blacks in it and some pure whites in it. So here are my Photoshop tests, and I do three of them, and it's the grayscale test, the flip test, and then the squint zoom test. So the first one, grayscale, is I place a hue saturation layer on top of the image and set the saturation to zero. So even without color, does the image still read? If not, you may need to make some changes. Our visual system works best with darks and lights, so an image that works in grayscale will almost always work no matter what your color choice. Next is the flip the image test, and you, what you do is you flip it horizontally, or sometimes vertically, and it'll look strange for about a minute, but slowly but surely your visual system will get used to seeing it that way, and then you can ask yourself, does the image feel balanced? 
and if not, then it might be uh, time to move an element this way or that. And then finally there's the squint test, and what you do is you either squint at your image, or you zoom out really, really far so the image is very small on screen, or you can even blur your image. And the idea is, is that if the image looks interesting that small or that blurry, then you likely have a really strong image. So now I'm going to do a quick practical example of the color and light tests. I won't be doing all of them, but I'll do a couple of them to show you how they might work. So this is an image which I made about 20 years ago, and this was before I started doing all of these sorts of tests. And I posted it, and somebody noted that one of the problems with it is that the area up here is very bright, and the most contrast is here, which leads the eye to this spot. And this is very near the edge of the painting. And if you look at it, let's uh, do the, the zoom test. So you look at it really small, and you can totally see that the eye does kind of gravitate towards this area, which means that you're looking over here and possibly off the page and missing all the cool detail here. So one way to just check on how to potentially fix this is here you can see I have an overlay layer um, and then I get a big soft brush like this and I've chosen the color black and let me just start making this a little bit darker up here. Um, this is about 10% opacity on the, uh, um, on the brush. And then I'll flip it so that now I have white and let me just add a little bit of brightness over in this spot here. Now if I zoom out, you'll note that the light here is bringing you more towards this area over here. And by putting this dark area up here, I'm taking uh, emphasis away from up here, which is directing the eye in a, in a better way. Now, of course, uh, this is a 3D image, and I wouldn't necessarily use this uh, overlay layer for my final image. You can see, for example, some of these colors are getting overly saturated. But it's a real quick way to check and see, okay, what is the best way to solve this compositional problem? And so in this case, I would go into the, the 3D, and I'd move my light so that the light was shining more in this area and uh, going off to dark as it went up in this area to improve the composition. And then just as another example, up here in I placed a levels, and you can see here that the resulting image has black blacks, which is this step down here, and white whites, which is this area up here. And so this has a nice full gamut of color, which is something that doesn't always have to be that way, but it, it tends to be nice when you have that full gamut, uh, as opposed to an image. Let me just uh, mess with this for a second. Let me do that and that. And then I'm gonna put another levels up here. Okay, and you can see that this level shows that there are no black blacks anymore in this image and there are no white whites anymore. So if this were my image here and I did this test, I might say to myself, okay, you know what? I need some more black blacks and white whites in order to have a more balanced image. So number four is form check. Check the shapes and forms in your painting. So first is, is there an interesting shape language? Is the shape language of your designs unique and interesting? If your spaceship, say, is a simple sphere, maybe add some parts of the sphere to cut out. Or is the sphere made up of smaller shapes that when combined give the impression of a sphere? Next is consistent shape language. Are all the shapes in the image part of the same vocabulary? Like if your painting is two warring armies, is it obvious through shape whether an individual soldier goes with one army or the other? And here's just a little example where I used these five different core shapes when I was painting this painting. So I made sure that all the shapes that are inside of this painting all derive from these core shapes, which give it consistency. Next is areas of visual detail and areas of visual rest. So are there areas of really, really complex detail? Uh, and are there areas of no detail? If there is more contrast between the parts of the minutia than there is between the parts of a larger design, then the shape of the larger design will likely be lost. And then finally, the primary, secondary, and tertiary shapes. Make sure that your design has a good mixture of large shapes, and then more medium shapes, and then little tiny shapes in order to provide a visually pleasing result. Number five is a texture check. So one thing many artists, including myself, tend to do when painting is to forget to make the materials really read like the materials they're supposed to be, or to make too many objects the same material. Material variety is really important to a successful painting. So first off, differentiate the materials. Make sure the different materials in your image look different. For example, the highlight on a piece of leather is going to look very different from the highlight on a piece of chrome. 
so make sure that your different materials look like the different materials you're trying to make. And also have more than one material. So for example, if you're making a robot, instead of using all the same gray dull metal, make some metal bright and shiny, uh, make some of it dull metal, make some of it painted metal, make some of it golden colored metal, and make sure to have some rust in there. And maybe find some spots for non-metal objects to add variety. So number six is ask someone's opinion. Fresh eyes are important, and no eyes are fresher than getting the opinion of someone we trust that has a good eye. But that said, remember, if someone says to change something, ask them why they want it changed, rather than just changing it. Everyone has a different way of solving a visual problem, and part of what makes you unique as an artist is your ability to solve problems in your own special way. But if you know the why something needs to be fixed, you might be able to fix it in a way that's more your own style. As an example, say someone says remove that car, but you really love that car and you feel you need that car in the painting to show some sort of story point. Ask why they want the car removed. They may say it's because it's so bright that the eye jumps to it instead of looking at the focal point of the image. And so you can fix it by making the car less bright. Now you fixed the real problem, but kept the car that was important for other reasons. Number seven is compare to earlier iterations. I tend to save iterations of my painting along the way, and sometimes I get so focused on the details of my final painting that I'll paint over some aspect of the earlier painting that was actually really cool. So I tend to compare my final painting to my sketch, and see if all the elements that made the sketch so cool still exist in the final painting. Or maybe the building being one centimeter over to the left in iteration five really looked better than it, whatever it is in my final painting. And so it convinces me to move that building back. Number eight is compare to others' work. So the Ikea effect is if you put effort into something, you will automatically think it's better than it really is. So to break that spell, gather some other artist's work and compare it to the painting you just made. And note, this is not to give you ideas to copy. You don't want your image to look like their images. Instead, you want to put your image alongside the other images and see if your image holds up. Obviously, if you've picked the work of your heroes, you may still feel like your work doesn't look as good as theirs does, but that shouldn't frustrate you. Comparing your image may reveal some smaller truths, like maybe comparing to the other work you've chosen to compare it to, you suddenly realize that your work is far too monochrome, and you'll be inspired to add more color to your image. Or your work isn't as detailed, and so you go back and add some extra detail. It's important to eject a little truth into how good your image looks, but take that truth and don't get frustrated by it. Use it as a springboard to improve your own results. Number nine is leave the image. So stop working on the image and come back to it a few days later with fresh eyes. After working on a painting for say 20 hours, I'm tired and I want the image to be done. And so I'm more likely to want to declare it done because I don't want to work on it anymore, not because it's actually done. But if I stay away for a few days or even go on vacation, I can come back to the painting and see what needs to be fixed, and I'll also have the energy to make those changes. And do note, that only works for personal pieces of work or for work for clients where the deadline isn't tomorrow. If the deadline is one hour from now, you're probably not going to be able to do this step. And finally, number 10 is to try on different screens. So look at the image on as many different computer setups and screens as possible. Desktop computers, iPads, iPhones, etc. This happens a lot. I stare at an image on my Cintiq for close to 20 hours doing my painting, and then I put it on Twitter, uh, look at it on my phone, and I instantly see the major compositional issue with the image, all because I've switched to a new screen. Then I have to take the image down, and I have to fix it. So more recently, I've been exporting a finished image to view it on my iPhone, and that lets me catch the issue before I actually post it for the world to see. So hopefully this checklist helps you the next time you're ready to call an image done. I have my own version of this checklist that's skewed a little more towards the things that I tend to forget. So let this list be a starting spot. If there's things you know that you're particularly weak at, make sure to emphasize them in your own personal tweak checklist. And your artwork will be better doing that one last final check. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this tutorial interesting. If you want to see more tutorials like this, please go to neilblevins.com and go to the art lesson section. Or if you want to be notified the next time I post a new video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.